Well, thank you very much. It is wonderful to be here with you tonight and just folks who seem to be so in love with life and are willing to dedicate an evening, and many of you dedicate your whole life to giving life and giving the opportunity for life for other people. I'll tell you, when I was asked to speak in West Palm Beach, this was not a tough assignment for me. <laughs> And uh, I have not been disappointed. I'm uh, staying at a wonderful hotel. You know, when you travel around the country speaking, you kind of develop a system of how to judge hotels. And I usually uh, determine how good a hotel is by the thickness of its towels. And uh, the hotel I'm in, they have really thick towels there. I'll just tell you, I'll have a hard time getting my suitcase shut tomorrow. It'll... <laughs> But this is just a, a wonderful area. And when you come from a little West Texas town of Ranger, Texas, you know, we didn't have things like this there. In fact, we didn't have much of anything. I can remember uh, knocking over a Flintstone jelly jar glass and breaking it, and my mother saying, well, I guess we can't have nice things. So, just the way we grew up. We were such a small town. You know, typically you'd see on the supermarket window there, possum, the other white meat. It was a <laughs> little rural town, you know. But I really wasn't very happy. And in my um, unhappiness, uh, I ate. I, I used to be about 60 pounds heavier than I am today. I was essentially carrying a little third grade around with me all the time. And, <laughs> He did all sorts of, of things to, to lose the weight. You know, if you lose weight, you want to lose it quickly, and I want to do it quickly. You know, I, I don't know if you're like me, but I, I pace in front of the microwave. You know, I want instant <laughs> results. And I, I drank a lot of Diet Coke, you know. I, I just drank a lot of that stuff, and then I realized that only fat people were drinking Diet Coke. <laughs> I think there was a chemical in there that, you know, keeps you heavy so you'll continue to drink it. I was really into eating, I'll tell you. The only French word I knew was buffet. And... <laughs> then I got on these Slim Fast Shakes. I don't know if you ever had a Slim Fast Shake. They were just fantastic, especially the Swiss chocolate Slim Fast Shake. Boy, it was just wonderful. And... I just, I drank those and started losing weight. I lost a lot of weight. And, and then I discovered how good they tasted with cheeseburger and fries. <laughs> well, the weight just came right back on. Anyway. Ranger was a, a strange place, you know. It was, uh, the women wore these little armadillo purses with the feet still attached. <laughs> Men ate pickles pig's feet, if you can imagine that. And we had a little small college outside of town. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It was a small college, Bob's College. Probably didn't hear it. Small. More people have heard of the graduate school, Billy Bob's. That was a little more famous. Fortunately, I didn't have to go there. I went, uh, I went off to a seminary and uh, studied uh, to work with people, I felt called to work with people who had emotional problems. And, you know, if you're called to work with people who have emotional problems, you, you have to go where the people are. And so I moved out to California. <laughs> it seems to be the right decision. And uh, that, that's where I met my wife. And she uh, she's really was a, an interesting person. We got married. We, we really didn't know each other too well. She didn't know me too well. And, uh, first year of our marriage, kind of a tough uh, first year of marriage, and I was going around speaking and ministering to people, and she had this bumper sticker, all men are idiots, I have married their king. <laughs> Very embarrassing. I think it was her way of uh, guaranteeing that I would never take her car to go and speak somewhere. <laughs> She finally replaced it with this other bumper sticker, which is a little nicer. It says, if first you don't succeed, do it the way your wife told you to in the first place. <laughs> that was a little bit better. We just had all sorts of problems that first year, you know. And uh, Well, I, I thought she was just low on submission. I thought that was really the, the problem. 
And um, then one night she was watching this Farrah Fawcett movie and told me to come in there and watch it. And here was a man burning up in his own bed. So, so I have never mentioned submission again. Just never saw a need to bring it up again. And I go to bed at night, I uh, make sure the lights are out, the gas can's in the garage. Go off to sleep. But we have a, an interesting marriage. You never know what she's gonna do next. We, we were in the pharmacy the other day, and uh, this is, we live in a town of about 20,000 people. Everybody knows everybody. And so we're in the pharmacy, and I had purchased something and, and gone to the front of the store to pace while she was doing what she was doing. And, uh, so she went to pay for her item there, and she noticed that I had left my package at the cash register. So she uh, yelled out across the pharmacy, uh, Steve, you forgot your laxatives. And, <laughs> so I just yelled back, well, please bring it after you get through paying for your lip hair remover. <laughs> She started it, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I've been sleeping out on the couch. And it's nice to sleep in a bed, get away. It's great. Well, it's good to see that you're not only pro-life, but you're pro-laugh. That's a, a very good thing. And I would love to go on about things like that, but that isn't the real reason that I'm here. And, you know, not everything in my life is... Uh, has been funny. In fact, there have been very, very many painful things in my life. And you know, I've always been very surprised by God in my life, as many of you, I'm sure, have been so surprised by God. Uh, initially in my life, I was very surprised at, at how difficult it was to live the Christian life. I just thought once you became a Christian, everything magically worked out. I was also surprised at how totally devastating you can be to your own life when you quit living the way the Lord wants you to live. That was very surprising to me. But in the, the later part of my life, I, I've been surprised by something I really didn't understand in the beginning, and that is the grace of God. Surprised that He truly is a God of second chances. Uh, I, I attended a, a Christian university, and I didn't live much like a Christian. But God is a great God of second chances, and uh, I was asked to come back and speak to chapel there at that wonderful university, Baylor University. There in front of 2,200 freshmen, more people than I had ever met when I was at the school, I was given a second chance to make some kind of impact, to have some kind of influence, which is certainly not what I had done when I had been there as a student. There are a lot of things I would have loved to have told those kids, but standing before them, I felt compelled to tell them about the experience that I had had when I was there at Baylor. And I shared with them, in fact, I told them, I said, I came here about 22 years ago to get a Christian education, but what I got was I got a girl pregnant, and I paid for her to have an abortion. And I told them of that experience and what it had done to me while I was there at that school and later in my life. See, because I, I really had just done what the world had said was the thing to do in that situation. I never thought about an alternative. I didn't know about resources. And so I went for the quick fix and the instant solution, just to get it out of the way. But it was a decision that to this day I still haven't gotten out of the way. There isn't a day that doesn't go by that I don't think about that decision and the child that will never be. And while I have experienced forgiveness, I hope I don't ever forget about that experience. I told those kids about what is termed post-abortion syndrome. Women go through it, but so do men. I became very depressed, very angry, I was on antidepressant medication. Uh, I became suicidal. Because you see, I didn't understand what I had done until after I had done it. So I told them about the living hell that I went through 
once I woke up to the reality that I could have saved a life, but I chose to pay for an abortion. After that chapel experience, I returned home and I received a phone call from a young lady. I hadn't spoken to her probably in 20 years. It was the young lady that I had been involved with at Baylor. She said, I heard that you spoke at chapel and told our story. And I said, yes, I, I wanted them to, to know what had happened. I wanted to spare some of them the misery that, that we had been through. I said, I, I didn't use your name, of course. She said, oh, I know. She said, it was good that you told them the story. She said, but I heard that you told them that you paid for the abortion. I said, yes, I, I wanted them to know that I had a part of this. She said, well, you know, maybe the next time you tell the story, that you should be a little more honest. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, you didn't just help pay for the abortion. You pressured me to have the abortion. I wanted to have the baby. But through your manipulation and your pressure, I felt there was no other alternative but to go along with what you wanted. What a horrible realization. At the depths of my cowardice, that when I could have had courage, I did just the opposite and really had forgotten just what a coward I had been. But it was true. And I'd love to tell you that, oh boy, I, I have all that character that I didn't have then. But it's still a part of my personality. It's still a part of who I am. I've since come to discover why this abortion decision was so devastating to me. It's pretty tough when you realize that the number one reason that women get an abortion is because there is some man like me either pressuring them to get the abortion or making sure that they know that they will not be there for them. Number one reason. Number two reason is there's a parent pressuring and usually it's a mother saying you need to have this done it was also devastating to me because of it was that maybe the first thing in my life that was completely and totally irreversible no amount of weeping sobbing mourning praying begging was going to bring back this life that was gone totally irreversible but more than anything, you know, in the reproductive process, the man's role ends at the point of conception and the woman takes over the reproductive process. It is then the man's role to provide and protect the life that he has helped create. And when a man doesn't do that, he feels guilt and shame. And when he goes even farther than that and helps destroy the life that he has created, he can experience devastating guilt and shame. And so that abortion experience, that thing that I did to so quickly get this out of the way, has left a mark on me that will always be there. It's ironic that I would get to come and share with you at this banquet on the anniversary, the 25th anniversary of Roe versus Wade the celebration of 37 million dead babies. It's ironic that I would be speaking to you in the midst of so many heroes who have fought for those lives. Every day, 4,000 abortions. Today, 4,000 abortions. It is the American Holocaust. And only in this country could we try to convince ourselves that we are such wonderful, compassionate, and loving people with all of our social programs and yet allow babies to be killed. In 1994, I was in Washington, D.C. at a prayer breakfast where Mother Teresa spoke with President Clinton and Mrs. Clinton right there on the podium. And she says, you can't call your nation a nation of love and kill babies. And then she said what 
you were all about. Get into the lives and hearts and meet the needs. And I want to tell you, it is an honor to be here with you because I don't know of a center that I've ever been to or spoken at, and I've spoken at a lot of centers that covered so many services as this center, so provided such a comprehensive level of care to folks in a crisis. And how wonderful that this is all part of a church, all sponsored by a church. And so it is a great honor for me to be here with you. You know, um, we live in a strange world. And many people in that world are looking for a political victory. But the political victory probably isn't going to come. People in Jesus' day were looking for some political victory, and he changed the world through their hearts, not through politics. And this isn't a very politically popular agenda item. Uh, if you want to be a part of a great moving force in our society, I don't know of anyone more divisive than this one. We're not making a lot of headway. Every day, somebody bails out on this agenda. How sad it would be to have to build your political career by sacrificing the lives of babies. How could you sleep at night? And yet it happens every day. But you know what's ironic to me? That even though politically this is pretty much a disaster, since 1990, every year, we're seeing fewer medical schools teach the abortion procedure. Fewer hospitals are willing to perform abortions. Fewer physicians are willing to perform abortions. There are fewer abortion clinics today than there were then. There are fewer abortions performed every year. We're actually winning the battle, not because of politics, but because of people like you who care enough to support this cause and this center and the right for a baby to be born and have life. Well, that's a wonderful thing, that in the midst of kind of a crummy political climate, God still does his work and restores lives. And that's really my message to you tonight, that God is a great God of second chances and a great God of restoration. And I know that many of you came here because you wanted to support this center, but I'm hoping that some of you came here because God had a message to you that he wants to restore your life, that he wants to remove the guilt and the shame and the remorse. I don't know what that area of your life is, but I do know that God is a God of second chances. Shortly after my wife and I were married, I began to doubt that God was a God of second chances. My wife and I discovered, ironically, that we were an infertile couple. Seven years we went through the infertility rites of the medical profession and every month was another month of despair and depression and lost hope. Now I hear a lot of people say that if you want God to act in your life, you have to have a lot of faith. In fact, I see people on, you know, Christian television with big hair a lot of times. They'll say that, <laughs> that um, they, they'll t tell you that, that you have to, to kind of get your faith act together before God will move in your life. And I understand what they're saying, but I'm glad that it just doesn't work that way. Because God began to work in my life, as in many of yours, not when I was at the peak of my faith performance here, but when really I, we were about to give up on God. I questioned whether he had a plan or even knew that we were struggling and in pain. It was at that point that God stepped in and initiated his plan of restoration for me and my wife, just as he will do it for everyone here and has done it for many of you already. But that plan began... In the summer of 1990, I was asked to uh, go to Atlanta, Georgia and speak to a group of 4,000 African-American charismatic Christians. Now, why they asked me to come and do this, I have no idea. I'm, I am not charismatic and 
it was just a, a great experience to go and speak to these people. Now, this was not exactly like it, it was here tonight, because when you speak to 4,000 African-American charismatic Christians, it's not really speaking, it's more of a dialogue. <laughs> you, you have constant feedback the whole time you're talking. You know how you're doing at every moment. And if you're not doing too well, it can be ugly. But there in Atlanta, Georgia, I spoke to these people, and when it was over with, one of these wonderful women came up to me and said, God told me to give you a message. He, he, he just said, I need to go talk to you in the middle of you talking. Well, I just bought a new car, and I knew I'd paid too much for it, so I figured, you know, he was going to tell me to give it back, and so I was ready to hear that. And... <laughs> but that wasn't what she said. You know, she said that God told me to tell you you're going to have a baby. I explained to her that my wife and I were infertile, and she said, I don't care if you're infertile. God told me to tell you you're going to have a baby. <laughs> a, a very pushy African-American. <laughs> so, that was on July the 3rd, and that day at lunch, my publisher lives in Atlanta. I had lunch with him. Victor Oliver is his name. And over lunch, he asked what Sandy and I were going to do about children. He knew our story, knew the struggle we'd been through. I said, Victor, well, just this week, Sandy and I talked about maybe we would consider adopting a baby. Now, this is a very painful process to go through. We know many couples who want to have a baby, and maybe they're interviewed by 300 potential uh, parents and birth parents and are rejected every time, and they never get to adopt a baby. So it's a very painful process. But Sandy said she believed she was ready to enter into that process. Well, Victor got a smile on his face and he said, you know, Steve, my best friend's daughter is 16 years old. Her boyfriend is 16 and she's pregnant. And they're looking for a Christian couple to raise their child. They have decided they will not abort this baby. He said, would you like to meet her? Well, my wife rarely travels with me, but on July the 3rd, she was in Atlanta, Georgia with me. I, I don't know, maybe she was low on humidity or something like that, but there she was. And, and so I talked to her and we did. And so on July the 4th of 1990, we met with this wonderful, courageous couple who had made a decision that I didn't have the courage to make. And we just fell in love with them and, and uh, they liked us and they never talked to another couple. They decided that we would be the parents of their baby. And so we went home to prepare to be parents. On Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1990, we went to sleep, but we didn't sleep very long because we got a phone call <coughs> that our baby had been born. And so on Christmas Day, we uh, got on a plane. Uh, Sandy had a friend who'd had a couple of these and knew how they worked, so she went with us. <laughs> and, uh, We didn't know anything, so uh, we were scared. And so we flew to Atlanta on Christmas Day. And there in a hotel room, they brought this little baby. And for some reason, they didn't take her over to my wife. They brought her right to me, and they put her in my arms. And uh, I, I leaned over, and I, I did what I do every night that I'm home. I kissed her. It wasn't just a baby, you know. It was God giving back to me the very thing that I had destroyed. Now, that's the kind of God that we have. That's the kind of grace that we have from God. Now, that's kind of scary for some Christians. But that's the, the joy of the Lord, is to restore to us the things that we have destroyed. And only He can do it. I want to tell you, this is some baby. I'd put her up against any of your children. <laughs> She's wonderful. It's been a great experience. Other than that, taking your mother's wedding ring to school that day, it's really been a great, uh, <laughs> great blessing. Just a while back, I was... Uh, I took Madeline, Madeline Victoria Arterburn is her name. I took Madeline 
to a circus. And it was a spectacular circus. And there was this clown act, and in the middle of this clown act, everybody's on their feet, screaming and laughing. And my daughter, when she laughs, she has the greatest laugh. And she was just laughing at these clowns. And everybody was having a great time, and I was seated, <laughs> just crying my eyes out. Because I had a six-year-old daughter that I could take to a circus. Because somebody was brave. And uh, I, I just want to tell all of you, who were involved with this ministry, who not only saved babies and not only helped people through a crisis, but through your work, people like me who have no hope of being a parent can be a parent. I, I want to thank you because you have made my life. You have restored my life. You have given my life meaning that would never have. That's why uh, it's really worth it for me not to kiss her goodnight tonight to come here and be with you and preach in the morning because I know that you're the heroes and I just want to encourage you to um, to continue your support of this ministry uh, some of you are great prayer warriors some of you are wonderful volunteers uh, this isn't a fundraiser but some of you may want to to give to this ministry and there are envelopes there on the table that you can do that but more than anything else, I just want you to be encouraged that this is not our fight, it's God's fight. And we're making progress, not because of politics, but because of love. Love for these mothers, love for these children, and love for the dads too. So I encourage you to keep up the fight for life. And God bless all of you as you do that. Thank you. I'd like to talk about authentic Christianity and the power of the truth because you know the truth really does have the power to free the world do you believe that but we live in a world that is very confused and very very messed up today is sanctity of life Sunday where we commemorate the death of 35 million babies that have died since the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision 25 years ago. For every three births in America, there is an abortion. Isn't that amazing? 4,000 every day, 1.4 million every year. And if that rate continues, by the age of 45, 43% of all women will have had an abortion here in America. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is before every person a very wide and pleasant road that seems so right, but always ends in death and destruction. And here, the pro-choice folks have made a case that seems so right, but it always ends in death and destruction. It seems that only in this country could we profess to be a loving and wonderful nation with all of our fabulous social programs and still allow babies to be killed? 4,000 a day. The world is in trouble, and we, the church, have the answer. And sometimes we need to ask, why is it that the world doesn't respond to the truth that we have? They need our truth. But many times when the world thinks of the church and thinks of Christians, they think of some minister on television begging for them to make a $1,000 vow to their ministry. Or they think of some evangelist with a prostitute. They have seen the caricature of Jesus Christ and not the character, and they have said, if that's what it's all about, I want no part of it. They've seen the the massacre with Jim Jones, the scandal with Jimmy Swaggart or Jim Baker. In fact, 
If your name is Jim, you might uh, watch out. It, it's not a good trend that, that's going there. And, but the world sees this and they say, if that's what Christianity is all about, if that's what the church is all about, I want no part of it. Or they see people with anger and bitterness and hatred that they express in the name of Jesus Christ. And Christ calls us to abandon those things and become authentic Christians. And once we do, the world will respond to the message that we have. I was watching a, a television commercial right after I read a story about Purdue Farms chicken, which supposedly sells more chicken in the United States than any other chicken producing company. And I couldn't figure out why they could sell so much chicken until I saw this commercial that had Frank Purdue, the founder of Purdue Farms Chicken, on there, and I was watching him sell chicken, and, and uh, the secret is Frank Purdue looks just like a little chicken. <laughs> you know, he's got a little bald head and a beak nose, and uh, just parts his hair in a circle here, and the little uh, hair that looks like feathers. It looks like a baby chick seated on the shoulders of a, of a grown man. And, and I think people go in to buy some chicken, and, and they think, I need to get some chicken. That vision of this little chick man comes in their mind, and they can't help but to purchase Purdue Farms chicken. Well, what a lesson for all of us, you know, that if you want to sell chicken, it really helps to look like a, a chicken. <laughs> and if we would like for people to accept the truth of Jesus Christ, it would really help if we would choose to look like Jesus Christ. Then the world would listen to our message. Well, the truth doesn't only have the power to free the world, but it has the power to free the church, too. You know, the church is often not a place where people come to heal, but a place where people come to hide. They put on their superficial smiles and say the superficial things you're supposed to say at church, and then they go home and wonder why it was such a superficial experience. Because we're afraid to share with others who we really are and what we're going through. How we ever came up with this idea of church, I don't know. I mean, all through the Bible, you see Jesus, the, the Lord of the universe, revealing through Scripture the problems that he's had with his family. I mean, right there in the beginning, you have Adam and Eve starting out with the, the first eating disorder there and uh, blowing it for the rest of us. And, and, um, and now we're all part of the Adam's family. It's just reality that we've got problems. We think of King David and, and the, the mess that he made of his life, a man after God's own heart. All of these things revealed. No angelic editor editing out the bad stuff of God's family. It's all right there. And yet we, for some reason, believe that we honor God by hiding and faking. James 5.16 says, Confess your sins one to another. Then you'll know how to pray for each other. You'll experience healing. When's the last time somebody confessed a sin? Often in our churches, we create monuments to ourselves and our image, and we fail to be a church. My wife and I were in a support group in one of the early churches of our early marriages where we attended it was a very superficial group, and there was a lot of superficial sharing going on. And my wife said, you know, if we're going to go back to this group, we're going to share with these people who we really are and what we're experiencing and what we're going through. And so the next week we did go back, and, and she openly shared about the problems that we had had in our first year of marriage, the intimacy that just wasn't there, and the, the deep pain and, and embarrassment that we felt over it. It was such a threat to these other people that were a part of this group. They felt so threatened that they might have to reveal something true and real about themselves that they never came back to be a part of that group again. That was our experience of sharing openly and authentically. And I would just pray that you would never, ever be in a situation where you would shame someone for their problem, that this would be a place where people could come and they could heal. How marvelous it is that you have a crisis pregnancy ministry as a part of this church because many times secrets 
are revealed there that often are never revealed within the church. If statistics are correct, about 25% of Christian women will have an abortion, but we don't talk about it. Women talk about abortion, but not about their own abortion. In the, uh, in the book, Listening to Women, Looking for Alternatives to Abortion by Frederica Matthews Green, she reveals that there's another secret in the Christian church too, that not only do many women choose to have an abortion, but the number one reason that they have that abortion is because of a relationship. The number one reason is that a man, a boyfriend, or a husband has pressured or demanded that abortion be performed. The second most prevalent reason is that a mother has been the one to pressure the daughter to have the abortion. And this is not the world out there. It's the church in here. Because you see, many times these abortions are performed because we're afraid for the church to know that we are human and that we have problems. We're more interested in how we look than the life of a child. That's the reality of the church, many churches. The truth has the power to free the world and, and the truth has the power to free the church if we will just be open and authentic. But the truth also has the power to free each individual here. Oftentimes we hear people say, well, just, just go on with your life. You have nothing to share. You know, Jeremiah 16, 6, uh, 6, 14 in the, in the Living Bible says you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. And many people go through life trying to say that the wound isn't there, but it is. People shouldn't deal with their past unless their past is affecting their present. And then you're not dealing with your past, you're dealing with today. And oftentimes we see people act like they have no problem, yet they spew their venom and anger and bitterness and rage out over their family and over others. When all it would take would be for them to humble themselves, to become open and honest about who they are and what they're going through. You know, whatever we don't resolve, we reproduce in our children. Victims become victimizers. That's not just child molesters. That's people who are angry, depressed, who are bitter, who have a spirit of meanness and unforgiveness. And so it is our challenge to be authentic Christians that we would humble ourselves to be open with others after we have become brave and courageous enough to face the truth about who we really are. One of the reasons that I am here is because of the truth in my own life. The figure, 35 million babies, is a large number. But one of those babies was mine. I paid for a young woman to have an abortion. No, I, I pressured her to have an abortion. And the guilt and the shame and the remorse over that decision, one that I still relive every day of my life, but at that time caused about 80 ulcers to eat at me. And one doctor told me that I would either die, I would have surgery, or something in my life had to change. And fortunately, the thing that changed was I was able to experience the grace that God has for each of us. God is a great God of second chances. And I believe that maybe one of the reasons that you're here today is because there's some area of your life that needs restoration. Maybe it has nothing to do with abortion or, or life or the pro-life movement. But God brought you here today because he wanted you to hear a message that it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done, nothing is too bad for him. He still has a plan and he's ready to implement that plan. It was many years before I came to understand that power of God to restore. But in 1990, a young couple got pregnant and decided not to have an abortion, more courageous than I ever was in their situation. 
And on Christmas Eve of 1990, their baby was born and we adopted her and she is our daughter now, our seven-year-old daughter, Madeline Victoria Arterburn. God gave back to me the very thing that I had destroyed. And what a wonderful child. I actually have a picture if you'd uh, like to see afterwards. I would uh, put her up against any of your children. I'll, I'll tell you that. She's a wonderful child. It's, it's amazing what children say. They, they say what they hear, and we pray with her so much. And she believes now that every prayer begins, and she still prays this way, Dear Jesus, thank you for Madeline. She just thinks that's the way every prayer starts. But I'm just wondering if today on this day, the irony is that God has a plan for you, that you have no idea what it is, but in his divine wisdom, he has brought you here. Maybe it's because you helped pay for an abortion. Maybe you pressured someone. Maybe it's because he wants you to support the ministry of pro-life of this church. Today on the 25th anniversary of Roe versus Wade, maybe we should consider who this Roe was. Roe was a, a lady named Norma McCorvey. And 25 years ago, she had never had an abortion, but they needed someone to sign the legal petition. And 25 years ago, abortion became her life. In fact, in one interview, she said, this is the only thing that I live for. I live, eat, breathe, and think everything about abortion. She lived in Dallas, Texas, and they said that she could drink or out-drink any of the men or out-cuss any of the men that hung out in the bars where uh, she hung out. Ironically, one of the pro-life ministries, Operation Rescue, moved in next door to where Norma McCorvey, the row of Roe versus Wade, worked. She worked in a place called A Choice for Women. It was an abortion clinic. And so here, side by side, was a group of pro-abortionists, and here was a group of pro-life people who had to learn to live together. This woman was so full of venom that she would confront people in the Operation Rescue pro-life movement and she would spit in their face. And you know what they would do in return? They would tell her that they loved her and that they forgave her. They became her friend. One woman came to work with her seven-year-old daughter named Emily. And rather than tell Emily, oh, don't go near that woman, she's the worst thing you could ever imagine, she's everything that we're not for, she let her daughter Emily develop a relationship with Norma McCorvey. And for the first time, Norma, who had had three children, all of which had been adopted out, one was a forced adoption, for the first time she fell in love with a child. Her mother shared that when she was engaged, she almost aborted Emily. It made her love her even more but started some questions in the mind of Norma McCorvey. Emily loved this lady, and Norma looked forward to going to work to receive a hug from a child. And one day, Emily invited her to go to church. She refused, but then she relented. And finally, she said yes. And let me read to you some of her words. She said, yes, not out of a sudden need for God, but because she was tired of telling this little girl, Emily, no, I won't go to church. Well, she went to church, and Pastor Morris Sheets of the Hillcrest Church ended his sermon with a compelling evangelistic call asking, is anyone here tired of living a sinner's life? And immediately, Norma felt overwhelmed by her need to respond. How could I say no, Norma recalls. I had been tired of it for years, but it was the only life I knew. Norma cautiously raised her hand, then opened her eyes and looked up to see if that was really her hand in the air. And it was, and she couldn't believe it. She re 
she repeated over and over again, I just want to undo all the evil I've done in this world. I'm so sorry, God. I'm so sorry. As for abortion, I just want to undo it. I want it to all go away. She says, I'm 100% sold out to Jesus and 100% pro-life. No exceptions. No compromise. She's become a poet. And let me read you one of her poems. It's entitled, Empty Playgrounds. I sit across from a playground I visited today with a small child. I know of such places where children play, but sadly, there's none of them here today. Empty playgrounds all around, playful children not to be found. Heal me of this broken heart. Lord, give me a brand new start and help me do my part for them. And every time I see an empty playground, yours will be full of children who have a home. In your presence, Lord, and near your throne, radiant faces unashamed and whole again, I feel now I am one of them because of mercy. Father, you gave us your only son. He shed his blood for every one. Forgive us, O Lord, their sins today, and for those of the past, wipe them away. I sit across from a playground. God has the ability to change a heart. And today, a heart that was once committed to abortion, the beginning of legalized abortion in this country, is now a believer just like us. Her life is dedicated to saving babies. Norm, Norma McCorvey, the Roe of Roe versus Wade. Well, I don't know what it is in your heart that needs restoration. But I come with you with a message of hope that God wants to restore that to you. And it may not be in the way that you dreamed or the way that you thought it would happen, but he will make a way. And finally, I just want to say how moved I am by what you do in this church for mothers, for fathers, and for children. And I pray that you will continue to keep up that wonderful fight for life. You know, God laid out two choices for mankind in Deuteronomy 30:19. I want to read it to you. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Thank you for all of you who have chosen life. God bless you. Good morning. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that my life has many testimonies, and there are many areas where God has touched me. Um, Time-wise, he has me focused on the ones that I'm going to talk about today. I was raised in a home where not only where drinking and drug use, they were okay, they were practiced. Um, my life as a child was very turbulent. My parents fought all the time. Um, although I knew my dad loved me, he didn't know how to show that to me. Um, his first love was drinking and drugs. So naturally, by the time I was 12, I began to search for what I could not find at home through men, through drugs, and through alcohol myself. After a very promiscuous lifestyle, by the time I was 16, I had my first child, whom I, whom I love very much. I tried to stay straight. But my bondage to drugs and alcohol, was, it was too strong. I tried treatments. I tried meetings. Nothing worked. I could not stop. Somewhere in this time, my mom, Katie Hedler, became a Christian, and she began to pray for me. And this would prove to be a long, hard, but fruitful journey for us. As my life continued downhill, I was out of control. Because of God's love for me, 
He continued to pursue me, but because of my selfishness, I continued to choose my own path. After series of, of, of series of events in my life, I found myself, not for the first time, at First Baptist Church Crisis Pregnancy Center, where a lady named Nancy Atkins once again pointed me to Christ. She told me that I could come back and they would disciple me. I didn't know what that meant, but I told her, okay, I'll call. Instead, I went home, called my friends, went drinking and making my usual choices again for a couple more weeks. Finally, one day, I was just so tired of it all, I decided to call the Crisis Pregnancy Center again and find out about this discipling they had told me about. I came in for a counseling session, as they called it, and through some things that were said, it finally made sense to me. I finally understood. And it was then that God did something for me, Kristen Reese, that I did not deserve. He gave me the gift of Jesus Christ. He gave me a second chance. I chose at that time to stop running and to surrender my life to Christ. My life began to change instantly, giving testimony to the, to the scripture in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Although the change had come, I did not walk off into the sunset as a fairy tale. Life is still life, and I'm still very much in process. There have been very dramatic changes in my life, but with these changes have come new challenges. And just as God has not left me alone, the people of God have not left me alone. The women at Crisis Pregnancy Center, Life Care Ministries, and many friends here at First Baptist Church have stood by me and walked with me through these new challenges I have faced. Right now, I live at Samaritan Gardens under the title of Life Journey, which is another ministry area of life care. And just as God does, they show me their continual love and support. I can truly say my life has been touched and transformed by the body of Christ. That day at the Crisis Pregnancy Center, when I chose to surrender to Christ, I made a decision that since then my husband and many other people have thanked me for. I chose not to have an abortion, and I chose life. For those of you who know me, you already know the life that was affected that day, but for those of you who don't, I'd like to introduce you to her. This is Brianna Reese with my new father, Mike Hedler. And I would just like to say, as a word of encouragement to those of you parents who have prodigal children, to keep praying because prayer works. Thank you.